morning, everyone. We have two talks today. There they are. We have two of our PGY2s presenting. Uh, Lydia Sauer will go first. She is our resident expert in all things uh, macular pigment and macular pathology. And she will be presenting on the benefit of fluorescence lifetime imaging in macular TNN dictation type 2. Uh, so we'll get started with her and then Dr. Petty, I'll get that update in between. How does that sound? Perfect. Lydia, go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And thank you for that introduction. Let me share my screen. All right. Can you see my slides? Yep. Video is good. Audio is good. Great. So thank you very much for uh, having me today to present at Grand Rounds. And I would like to talk about the benefit of fluorescence lifetime imaging of thermoscopy, FLEO, in understanding macular telangiectasia type 2. And I do not have any financial disclosures, but the FLEO device was provided to the University of Utah by Heidelberg Engineering at no cost, and is not yet FDA approved and only used for research purposes. And I would also like to thank the LMI, the Lowy family, and the Arx Foundation. So to start off with, I would like to talk a little bit about patient experiences, patients that have MACTEL. How is it uh, when they are getting the diagnose and are they getting diagnosed correctly or incorrectly? So this is uh, from one patient. You can find it online. It's, um, it says, the retinal specialist diagnosed me with MACTEL on my first visit. I had a follow-up appointment a few weeks later for OCT exam. He told me that there was no, no known cause for MACTEL and no treatment. He said I should have an eye exam every six months to track changes in my vision. He did not paint a picture of gloom and doom, but also did not offer much information. He told me that he had only seen about 10 patients with MACTEL during his entire career. Another patient describes, I was misdiagnosed with cone dystrophy for the first couple of years. The question I asked in my first I was asked in my first diagnostic appointment was, "Have you ever been a sun gazer?" I had no idea what that was and had to look it up online when I got home. I received the correct diagnosis for MacTell only when I thought a second opinion at a research hospital. And then another patient, uh, Deborah, her path uh, to receiving the diagnosis of MACTEL was also not straightforward. She went to a retinal specialist because her vision was getting blurry and she was seeing squiggly lines. That is where straight lines did not appear straight. She was initially told that she had macular degeneration with a retinal bleed and began to receive inheritable injections. And after being treated for about two years, she switched retinal doctors as she moved across the country and then was diagnosed correctly with MACTEL later on. And she said, I had all sorts of people looking at my eye. At the time, they said there's no cure. They don't know what causes it and they don't know how fast it will pro progress. They said it will only affect my central vision and it will probably take years. And that's where things stood for a while. So with those impressions, I would like to start and uh, just highlight the importance of diagnosing diseases correctly and understanding the differences between different macular diseases in the human eye. And the, uh, these uh, quotes came from uh, the Lowy Medical Research Institute who provides a very excellent resource for patients and physicians. And it's a, pri it's a privately funded organization that really uh, pushes the research in the MACTEL uh, in the MACTEL group, and I'm very honored to be part of this research and share what we have found in the last couple of years. So MACTEL, it's a rare bilateral disease that leads to gradual loss of central vision. The prevalence was said to be between one in a thousand to one in 20,000, but due to it being misdiagnosed very frequently, we believe that the prevalence is much higher. The age of onset is typically between 40 and 60 years, and it's likely an autosomal dominant disease with vertical transmission. Sometimes it's mistaken for AMD because macular degeneration has a similar pattern of neovascularization and retina alterations usually begin in the temporal paracentral area. And that area temporal to the fovea is really believed to be the epicenter of the disease. 
Later on, the disease may encompass the entire area of six degrees horizontally to five degrees vertically centered at the foveola, and we call that the MACTAL zone. And there are multiple promising clinical trials ongoing at the moment. So diagnosing MACTAL with retinal imaging, we have a lot of different imaging modalities available, including fluorescein angiography that commonly shows vascular uh, changes and leakage, but it does not show all the changes that can occur in MACTEL. OCT, on the other hand, is a non-invasive technique um, that shows asymmetry of the fovea and hyporeflective cavities in the neurosensory retina, and it is used for the inclusion in clinical trials. And there are a lot of other imaging modalities, such as code focal reflectance imaging, or known as blue light reflectance imaging, macular pigment density, where instead of a central peak, we have a ring surrounding the MACTEL zone, and confocal adaptic, uh, adaptive optics um, of thermoscopes. It usually take a long time and are not as feasible in the clinical arm. And then we have fluorescence lifetime imaging of thermoscopy, which is a new technique that I would like to talk a little bit about today. As always, I start with a photograph that I took uh, a, couple, uh, a couple months ago. This was Comet Neowise back in 2020. And when we look at the black and white picture, we see what's going on. But when we look at a picture in color, it just has a lot more detail and we can appreciate uh, the beauty of this comet a lot better. In the same way, we look at the human eye and we are very used to looking at these black and white images but when we take it to a colorful image, we may notice differences that areas that appear dark may not appear the same in, in the color image. Or here, when we look at an eye with drusen and macular degeneration, when we look at the colorful FLEO image here, it shows us a complete different pattern. Or in this eye, a patient that was diagnosed with MACTEL that looks nearly normal when we just look at the autofluorescence image, but with FLEO, we can appreciate a ring of prolonged lifetimes as a sign of the disease. So very briefly, what is FLEO? FLEO is a non-invasive imaging technique. It's produced by Heidelberg uh, Engineering, and it takes approximately two minutes to take a picture of the eye of patients. It was developed in Germany, and this is the first publication that was ever published in 2002, and the images look completely different. At that time, the acquisition time was about 20 to 25 minutes. But just a few years later, the images started to look more similar to what we're used to today. There have been a lot of different publications um, in the recent years, and it has gained a lot of interest to investigate FLEO in the scientific community. When I think of FLEO, I always think of it a little bit like OCT. When we look at the very first images of OCT, it looked completely different. And until we're getting to the high resolution OCT, that is kind of the next step of OCT imaging uh, currently, these images look completely different from the beginning. And I'm wondering if FLEO may be similar in that. And it's very exciting to be part of this research. Um, and I don't think we know yet where it's going, but we know that it's very helpful. So what is FLEO? It is fluorescence-based. So fluorescence, um, with uh, when there's energy that goes on to a molecule, the, uh, the, or the molecules are elevated to a higher vibrational level. And as they uh, fall back to the lower vibrational level, they send out photons. And those photons is what we call fluorescence. And essentially, there are three dimensions that we can look at from these photons that come back. We can look at the spectrum of those photons, so the wavelengths. We can look at the brightness, which is what we do in autofluorescence imaging. And then we can look at the lifetime, which is the time it takes for those photons to come back. So what we do with FLEO is we look at that lifetime. We have a 256 by 256 pixel image. And in each of these pixels, we count the photons that come back over time. So we receive a statistic of photons that in the beginning we would have the impulse and then we just take the time and collect the photons that come back. So these blue dots would be the amount of photons over time. 
And we can then approximate that decay and get a certain time. And when we look at different spots in the retina, we see that in the fovea, the curve is much more steep than at the optic nerve. And that is the difference in the different lifetimes that we measure. We also look at two spectral wavelength channels, but I'm not going to touch on that very much today. But what we see in the healthy image is always a very similar pattern of long lifetimes at the optic nerve and short lifetimes in the fovea. The short lifetimes are believed to be macular pigment. The kind of intermediate lifetimes uh, are believed to come from the retinal pigment epithelium and the lipofuscin. And then long lifetimes stem from collagen and elastin. And comparing this image in the, from the healthy eye to all the retinal diseases, it is very striking that we see a lot of different patterns in the different retinal diseases. And today, as I mentioned, I will uh, highlight the findings that we've had in macular telangiectasia type two. So when we first looked at patients with MACTEL, what we saw is that there's always a temporal crescent of prolonged fluor lifetimes um, that we can see in our images. And I would like to show the very first slide that I ever showed to Dr. Bernstein. These are the first four patients at the Moran that received MACTEL. And I kind of showed him, oh, it looks like there's this prolongation of lifetimes, this blue crescent that we can see in all of these images. And when we clinically look at patients that have advanced MACTEL, such as this individual who is a male that is only 24 years old, but when I would look in his eye as a PGY2, I would likely realize that there is, or hopefully realize that there is a bullseye uh, maculopathy. And when we look at other imaging in OCT, we see hyporeflective cysts. In outer fluorescence imaging, we see that there are abnormalities. We see that in blue light reflectance, there's a bullseye. Um, there's a lot of leakage in fluorescein angiography. And when we look at the FLEO image, we clearly can see that that area shows abnormalities so that instead of just a center of short red lifetimes, uh, there is a prolongation of lifetimes in a ring-like pattern. But when we look at this eye, frankly, if I would see this patient in clinic, I'm not sure if I would be advanced enough to pick up that how altered the fovea is. And also looking at clinical imaging in this patient, it's a 56-year-old with 2020 vision. Um, this could be just a regular eye exam. I think in the OCT, we would uh, our attention would be drawn to this hyporeflective cyst. But if the cyst would be absent, which can also happen, I think it would be very difficult to really understand what's going on. There's a little bit of leakage in fluorescein angiography, but FLEO very, very clearly shows the temporal crescent and leaves no doubt that this patient has MACTEL. In addition, FLEO may be able to pick up asymptomatic family members. So this is another family where both parents had a healthy clinical exam, but the daughter has MACTEL. And if we look and compare the images from the parents, we can see that the mother is likely the carrier of the disease. And in the past two years, we've done in the past couple of years, we've done a big analysis looking at family members, so first degree family members of patients with MACTEL, and we think that there are differences. There are some patients, um, family members that are uh, that have a signature of MACTEL, and others that do not. So we are hoping to see those patients again and see if the signature indeed is an early sign of MACTEL. What we do know is that there is one gene it's, uh, uh, that has been found in the serine uh, metabolism that can cause MACTEL. And we have a family at the Morani Center. This is the 24 year old proband who has MACTEL and he has two sisters, one of which is carrying the gene mutation and the other one is not. Both sisters, age 26 and 28, had a normal healthy clinical exam. But when we look at FLEO imaging, um, we could see that there are changes in the exam of the sister that has the gene mutation. And that is despite, as I mentioned, pretty, uh, pretty normal clinical exam, including OCT imaging and fluorescein angiography. Um, 
in addition to looking at, and that is very helpful because um, if we know that a person has the disease and with clinical trials approaching, it would be very helpful for those patients to be diagnosed correctly and early on in the disease. <clears throat> we also looked at changes over time and had 66 patients with MACTEL, um, 66 eyes with MACTEL that we uh, investigated longitudinally. And we saw that the FLEO lifetimes in the MACTAL zone um, prolonged, and they prolonged by about nine picoseconds uh, and eight picoseconds in the two respective um, spectral wavelength channels. We also found that this is independent of macular pigment because in a lot of discussions, it was us, it's just, just the macular pigment that is going down over time. Um, but we could show that there's no correlation um, of the changes in flu lifetimes with changes in macular pigment. So it really is something that is changing in the retina that cannot be associated with macular pigment. Or it's not caused by macular pigment, I should phrase it that way. Um, we also looked at OCT over time and found that in the first spectral channel where we see all the MACTEL changes with best contrast, um, these changes correlated to changes in the ellipsoid zone, um, which was indicated to be correlated with progression of MACTEL. Um, so the size of the ellipsoid loss correlated with uh, the FLEO lifetimes and also with different differences in the ellipsoid zone correlated with differences in the flu lifetimes. Um, and what I would like to highlight is that we can see the changes in FLEO even before there are changes in OCT, before there's an ellip ellipsoid zone loss and before there are uh, cystic cavities. But as the disease progresses, the OCT progresses, but FLEO lifetimes prolong as well, as is highlighted in this slide. So what we know at this point is that in MACTEL, we see that uh, these prolonged FLEO lifetimes in a temporal crescent or a ring within the MACTEL zone. And the FLEO lifetimes show this pattern very early in the disease, possibly even in the second generation of patients that have not even been diagnosed yet. And this change is visible prior to structural changes and structural damages. The FLEO lifetimes prolong over time, and the temporal crescent turns into a ring, and progression of disease can therefore be monitored with FLEO. And that prolongation of lifetimes is independent of macular pigment, but may be related to structural changes in the ellipsoid zone. What we really do not know is what is causing this prolongation of FLEO lifetimes, and are there other factors such as diabetes um, that could influence this pattern? So in the last year, we looked at patients with diabetes. We have 89 eyes from 89 patients um, that have MACTEL and have di uh, um, and have di uh, excuse me. Um, 45 of those were not diabetic and 18% were pre-diabetic and 37% were diabetic. Um, we had an independent grader that graded uh, uh, the diabetic retinopathy in these eyes and we included all uh, confounders um, such as cataracts or AMD or other retinal diseases. And we looked at the areas of interest, so the MACTAL zone and kind of the central areas in a standardized grid. And what we found that was really surprising because a lot of patients with MACTAL have diabetes um, is that the pattern is visible in patients with and without diabetic retinopathy. And, but it is completely independent of diabetes. So um, the FLEO lifetimes um, were completely, uh, there was no uh, significant difference between diabetic, pre-diabetic and not diabetic patients that had MACTAL in the FLEO lifetimes. And in addition, FLEO lifetimes also did not correlate with the A1C and with the BMI. And we were very surprised that uh, there was no correlation to the diabetes. Um, so although MACTEL has that high prevalence of diabetes, FLEO lifetimes and longitudinal changes associated or found in FLEO associated with MACTEL seem to be unrelated to diabetes. And the last study that we just submitted to AVO 
um, in addition to looking at diabetes right now is that we look at the sensitivity and specificity of Leo. Um, and we have had 161 patients uh, that were referred for FLEO imaging at the Moran Eye Center between 2018 and 2022. Out of those patients, 119 had MACTEL and showed the FLEO pattern. Five patients clinically had MACTEL, but the FLEO was inconclusive due to cataract and image quality in three and two cases, respectively. And then 37 patients were referred for FLEO imaging that clinically did not have MACTEL, but were diagnosed later on with other retinal diseases, such as Cornwall dystrophy, tamoxifen retinopathy, hydroxychloroquine toxicity, AMD, and others. And the FLEO uh, imaging was negative in all of these cases. So the ability of FLEO to detect the disease-related changes in patients with MACTEL has proven to be very helpful in the clinical practice um, at the Moran Eye Center. And in our cohort of the 161 patients that were just referred with the question, is it MACTEL or not? Um, FLEO had a high sensitivity of 96% and a specificity of 100% when determining if a patient has MACTEL or not. And here are a few patients uh, where FLEO is helpful in uh, research and in clinical practice. Uh, when we look at AMD versus MACTEL, um, I didn't talk about the AMD pattern a lot, but all eyes with AMD have this ring of blue that we cannot see in eyes with, AM, with MACTEL, whereas MACTEL has in the first spectral channel um, the temporal crescent of blue of long lifetimes that we can see even if a patient has both AMD and MACTEL. Here's an example of comparing MACTEL to hydroxychloroquine toxicity, where we can see that um, although in, on first glance, these two diseases may look similar, but when we look at the first and the second channel that are highlighted here, uh, hydroxychloroquine toxicity looks very different. Um, and we can distinguish it with using FLEO just because the, um, the lifetime distribution between the two channels is differs between the two diseases. And then this is a patient who was initially believed to have MACTEL because they have the cystic lesions and OCT imaging. They had a bullseye maculopathy. Their macular pigment had a ring, but it was not the typical ring outside the MACTEL zone that would be kind of around um, six to seven to eight degrees. Um, but instead it was a ring that was much more narrow to the phobia. And when we looked at this patient later on, we realized that this uh, was tamoxifen retinopathy and not MACTEL. So just looking at next steps, what, what are our next projects with, um, with MACTEL and FLEO? Um, we have a collaboration with uh, San Diego that, where there's a group that looks at metabolomics data, and we would like to correlate our findings to the metabolomics data from our patients. We also are hopefully very soon going to receive a high resolution OCT that we can compare to FLEO imaging. Um, and then we're also uh, collaborating with the neurology department to see if um, neuropathy, which is also common in patients with MACTEL, um, can be compared with FLEO by looking at punch biopsies. Um, we also have a collaboration with Dr. Aaron Lee looking at artificial intelligence, and there will be a poster at AVO from their group this year as well, um, kind of looking at if artificial intelligence can pick up the different signatures in FLEO uh, much easier than we may be able to in clinic when we just look at the pictures. So to conclude my talk, FLEO shows very early changes in MACTEL even before structural damages are visible. FLEO is helpful in the diagnosis of MACTEL. Um, and the FLEO lifetime changes correlate with the ellipsoid zone loss, which has shown to indicate progression of MACTEL. And there are a lot of other factors that do not correlate with FLEO lifetime changes. And what I think is uh, kind of the point where we're at right now is that if we find out what is causing the progression, so the further prolongation of our lifetimes, um, we may be able to determine what the actual cause of the progression of MACTEL is, which would be exciting to find out. 
And with that, I would like to thank all of our collaborators, um, especially Dr. Bernstein, who has been an amazing mentor, as well as everyone else at the Moran Eye Center that has been involved in this. And uh, again, the uh, LMI and the Lowy family. And thank you all for your attention. Thanks, Lydia. Uh, we can open it up for questions. We have about four or five minutes for questions if anyone has any. Lydia, I have a question. You know, with how genetically complex this disease is, and then with its, you know, um, you know, clinical presentation being variable, you know, so many kind of subclinical findings. With that specificity and sensitivity, could this, or do you anticipate this becoming um, perhaps a gold standard for diagnosis of subclinical, at least? I think the limitation mostly is that we do not have FLEO available at many centers. And I think for the gold standard, we would need more, uh, more FLEO devices in the first place. But the MacTel Foundation and the uh, LMI, they're very, very interested in this. And they think, and we think as well, that FLEO is a, could possibly be the gold standard if there would be more devices available. I think that's really the limiting factor that it's such an early, um, early in the stage of the technology um, that I, I, we think that it is helpful and that we see the signature very easy and better than in other modalities. But yeah, as I mentioned, there are just some limitations. Perfect, Monica, I've, go ahead, I've, I've gone ahead and asked you to unmute, so you should be able to unmute yourself. Um, go ahead, Monica. Yes, can you hear me okay? Audio is great. Perfect. Lydia, thank you so much for this impressive talk. Um, can you give us a short insight in the current status of um, ther therapeutical trials in MECTEL? Yeah, so um, uh, I know that there are a couple of ongoing trials. I uh, don't know if uh, the latest data has been published um, on the CNTF trial, but it seemed like there was initially a very uh, a very positive, like a, a difference when there's there's an M implant that just has a neuroprotective factor that gets implanted into the eyes, and the Moran Eye Center is part of this study. Um, the uh, initial report showed that there's a difference, and then um, we're still following these patients over time, but it seems to be promising. Um, and maybe Dr. Bernstein knows a little bit more about the current state because I'm not uh, as familiar with the very recent data because all the MACTEL meetings are just coming up uh, early this year when we'll get an update. So I think that is uh, something to stay tuned. Great. Uh, this, is Paul, this is Dr. Bernstein. Just to give you the update, the phase two for the CNTF trial was positive and they've gone to the phase three and um, that is and we're part of that but the the data has it's still not quite closed so we have not released the data on that yet so i don't know and no one knows yet but it should be announced within the next year and we're also looking at some nutritional interventions with serine but those are still in the early stages awesome well, thank you so much, Lydia. Thank you. Um, so as far as the update for the PGY3 class, I've talked with my classmates here. Uh, I have to be a little bit cryptic maybe, but I'll give a, a, a hint at where we're headed. Um, I can say that Ali likes the front of the eye or is drawn to the front of the eye. I am drawn to the back of the eye, Cole, uh, the, the inflow and outflow of the eye and Abigail, the things around the eye. So between the four of us, we have a, a, a pretty comprehensive uh, set of interests. Um, but there's it's like a new multi-specialty practice. Exactly, exactly. Speaking of multi-specialty, Tyler Etheridge <laughs> is going to be giving our, uh, our next presentation. He's a resident who wears many hats among them. Uh, ultra endurance athlete and stuntman. Um, and he is going to be talking about the use of intracameral tissue plasminogen activator in uveitic cataract surgery. Tyler, go ahead. 
Thank you, Sean. I don't know if getting hit by a car counts as me being a stunt man, but I was referring to a different stunt, but that that <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> Here, let me share my screen. Um, we okay. can see the screen. Audio is great. Perfect. So uh, thank you, Sean, for that introduction. I'll be presenting a research project that I was fortunate enough to be a part of as an intern during my elective year experience. I have no conflicts of interest. Uveitis is a group of eye diseases which are characterized by ocular inflammation due to autoimmune infectious or malignant etiologies. The presence of intraocular inflammation as well as its first line treatment steroid therapy both accelerate cataract formation. Furthermore, cataract surgery itself can exacerbate intraocular inflammation, which can lead to progression of eye disease and vision loss. Therefore, the ability to control intraocular inflammation perioperatively is critical for patients with uveitis. Tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA, has been used as an adjunct postoperative therapy to control intraocular inflammation after adult and pediatric cataract surgery, as well as for fibrinolysis after retina surgery. However, uh, there are limited reports on its use at the time of cataract surgery or in patients with uveitis. Therefore, we report the largest case series of intracameral TPA used at the time of cataract surgery. Specifically, uh, we selected for patients with uveitis who are at higher risk for postoperative inflammation, including patients requiring posterior sneculysis and assessed postoperative vision, intraocular pressure, postoperative signs of inflammation, and intraoperative and postoperative complications. A retrospective chart review was conducted to identify patients with uveitis who received intracameral TPA at the time of cataract surgery. All patients received care at the Moran Eye Center and the surgeries were performed by four different anterior segment surgeons between January, 2015 and January, 2021. Patients were included if they had a history of prior or current uveitis and if the surgery was a primary cataract extraction. In total, 36 consecutive eyes from 31 patients met inclusion criteria. 26 of the 36 eyes completed 12 months of follow-up. Two patients were lost to follow-up after post-op month one, and one was lost to follow-up after post-op month six. An additional patient died from unrelated systemic disease after six month follow-up and six patients are still awaiting their 12-month follow-up visits. Here we present the preoperative data. The mean age of our patient population was 36, with the youngest patient being five years old. Anterior uveitis was the most common subtype, and idiopathic was the most common diagnosis, followed by HLA B27, associated anterior uveitis, and then sarcoidosis. Eyes were without active inflammation for a mean of 5.8 months prior to cataract extraction. Over 90% of eyes had at least one coexisting ocular disease or structural complication with cystoid macular edema, glaucoma, and epiretinal membrane being the most common. Preoperative central macular thickness was obtained from 24 eyes with a mean of 340 microns. 24 eyes were on at least one steroid sparing immunomodulatory therapy at the time of cataract surgery. 23 of the 24 patients on immunomodulatory therapy were on an anti-metabolite with 18 of those patients on additional immunomodulatory therapy. And then one patient was on rituximab monotherapy. Perioperatively, beginning one week prior to surgery, patients were treated aggressively with systemic and local, as well as topical steroids and NSAIDs, 
to, present, to prevent any uveitis flare. 31 eyes received perioperative oral steroids with a mean prednisolone equivalent dose of 45 milligrams per day, leading up to surgery. Three eyes received perioperative intravitreal dexamethasone injection prior to surgery. Mean topical prednisolone equivalent dose was 3.5 drops per day, and mean catorlac equivalent dose was 2.7 drops per day. Here we present the intraoperative data. Every cataract surgery was performed using phaco emulsification. The most common type of lens implant implanted was a one-piece acrylic. The remainder were three-piece lenses. The vast majority of lenses were placed in the capsular bag. Synechiolysis of posterior and or peripheral anterior synechiae was performed in 61 per, uh, sorry 94% of cases. Tripan staining was used in 61% of cases and 83% of cases required an iris expansion device, either an iris hook or Melugan ring. All uh, capsular tens tension ring was placed in three cases due to diffuse zonular weakness, and there were no cases of focal zonular loss. Over half of these cataract surgeries were combined with a pars plana vitrectomy. In one case, an unplanned pars plana vitrectomy and retinal detachment repair was performed due to intraoperative discovery of a tractional macula off retinal detachment. The patient had a history of retinal detachment with silicone oil in the eye, and the view of the posterior segment prior to surgery was poor. A one-time intraoperative IV methyl prednisolone dose was administered in two cases, while intraoperative local steroid injections were used in 11 cases. Three cases did not receive any perioperative or intraoperative systemic or local steroids. However, almost all cases received intracameral antibiotics at the end of surgery. At the completion of surgery, TPA was injected intracamerally. The two doses injected were 12.5 micrograms and 25 micrograms. The dose given was at the discretion of the surgeon. 34 cases were uncomplicated. Two surgeries experienced complications, including one anterior capsular tear and one posterior capsular tear. The anterior capsular tear occurred in a patient with a dense fibrotic anterior capsule that required micro scissors to create the entire capsulotomy. Here we present the post-operative data. Preoperatively, mean log mar best corrected visual acuity was one or, or a Snellen equivalent of 2200. However, 13 patients had a best corrected visual acuity of greater than or equal to 1.3 log mar or Snellen equivalent 2400 or worse. And only four patients had a best corrected visual acuity of 0 0.3 log mar or a best corrected visual acuity of Snellen 2040. Postoperatively, mean logmar best corrected visual acuity was 0 0.7 or a Snellen equivalent of 2100. However, almost half of patients were able to achieve a postoperative best corrected visual acuity of 0 0.3 logmar or better at 12 month follow up. And only five remained at a best corrected visual acuity of greater than or equal to 1.3 logmar. The improvement in visual acuity was statistically as significant across all time points using a, a mixed effects ANOVA model. Multiple comparisons tests showed statistically significant improvement in visual acuity from baseline to postoperative month one, month six, and month 12. Mean preoperative IOP was 15. The baseline IOP lowering medication use was uncommon. Ocular hypertension was reported in 10 patients at postoperative month one, which dropped to two patients by postop month six. Postoperative mean IOP remained stable at all time points using a mixed effects ANOVA model. As expected, there was an increase in the number of IOP lowering medications used at postoperative week one, corresponding to ocular hypertension or steroid response. However, this returned to baseline by postoperative month one. 
the most used IOP lowering medications were carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, beta blockers, and alpha adrenergic ag uh, agonists. Prior to surgery, almost all eyes had minimal to no anterior chamber inflammation with an AC cell grade of 0 0.5 or less in 32 patients. By post-operative month one, most eyes, uh, 28, achieved an AC cell grade of 0 0.5 or less, which remained stable through post-operative month 12. Preoperatively, approximately half of eyes had a vitreous haze grade of 0 0.5 or less, though vitreous haze grade was unreported in 13 patients. At post-operative month 12, 22 eyes achieved a vitreous haze grade of 0 0.5 or less, with only three eyes having an unknown vitreous haze grade. Preoperatively, mean posterior synechiae was 8.2 clock hours, which improved to 0 0.1 clock hours by post-op month 12. Additional post-operative inflammation was noted in 45%, 48%, 45%, and 32% of eyes at post-op week one, month one, month six, and month 12. Corneal edema was the most common at post-operative week one and cystoid macular edema was the most common at all other time points. Of eyes with cystoid macular edema, mean central macular thickness was 644, 481, 517, and 503 microns respectively. New post-operative ocular diseases occurred in a low percentage of patients. Six eyes experienced hyphema at post-op week one, this was not unexpected as 94% of patients required synechiolysis and iris manipulation during their cataract surgery. Five cases resolved spontaneously without further intervention. One eye was found to have iris lens chafing from a haptic in the sulcus before persistent hyphema and was taken back to surgery for IOL repositioning, after which the hyphema resolved. One eye was noted to have a hyphema at post-op month six, but had also undergone parse plan of vitrectomy three weeks prior. Four eyes underwent repeated parse plan of vitrectomy. One required torque IOL repositioning due to a rotation of their IOL, which was complicated by posterior capsular tear and resultant sulcus placed IOL. Finally, mean oral prednisolone equivalent, topical prednisolone equivalent, and catorolac equivalent dose decreased over time as expected. A few patients required escalation of their IMT during their 12 months following cataract surgery with more requiring adjunctive uh, local or topical steroids. However, most eyes did not require escalation of IMT or steroid therapy. In discussion, the dose of TPA injected at the end of the case was at the discretion of the surgeon either a 25 microgram or 12.5 microgram dosing were administered based on patient age with children tending to receive the lower dose. We did see an improvement in best corrected visual acuity postoperatively with only 13 eyes having a best corrected visual acuity of 2400 or worse and only five eyes saw 2040 or better preoperatively compared to almost half of eyes achieving a postoperative best corrected visual acuity of 2040 by the 12 month follow-up and only five eyes remaining at 2400 or worse. However, if you look at the mean change in visual acuity, these eyes only gained one line of vision and this is likely due to the complexity of their underlying disease as well as multiple comorbid ocular diseases which may limit their visual potential. We did see a significant improvement in posterior synechiae postoperatively going from a mean of 8.1 clock hours to 0 0.1 clock hours. And finally, six eyes did experience postoperative hyphema at week one, five of which resolved without further intervention. We did select for patients with uveitis who are at higher risk for postoperative inflammation and complications, and most of whom who received posterior synechiolysis and iris manipulation at the time of surgery. A brief review of the literature on the topic shows that Dotan et al. performed a prospective cohort study investigating TPA in refractory, in refractory toxic anterior chamber segment syndrome after cataract surgery 
40 eyes were enrolled and treatment was performed 20 days after surgery. Results showed that one day after treatment, there was complete clearance of fibrin reaction in 80% of eyes and partial in 20%. At the one month evaluation, the fibrin reaction had completely resolved in 95% of patients. Mean visual acuity was not statistically significantly different. And there, however, there were no cases of uh, hyphema or increased intraocular pressure or other complications. The authors concluded that intracameral TPA at a dose of 25 micrograms is safe and effective for the treatment of refractory fibrin reaction after cataract surgery. Maheta Ed and Adams investigated the use of TPA retrospectively in the treatment of post-operative fibrinous membrane formation following pediatric cataract surgery. Of the 37 patients studied, four underwent intracranial TPA injection with a mean time to injection after surgery of seven days. Results showed that there was complete resolution of a fibrinous membrane in all cases and uh, without any complications at the three month follow-up visit. The authors concluded that TPA may be used safely and effectively at a dose of 25 micrograms for severe fibrinous membranes following pediatric cataract extraction. Satiri et al. performed the only double-blind randomized controlled trial to evaluate the efficacy of intracameral TPA and the prevention of a fibrinous effusion after lensectomy, anterior vitrectomy, and cataract surgery in children. 34 eyes were included and results showed the incidence of an intraocular fibrin membrane formation was statistically significantly lower in the case compared to the control group at two weeks of postoperative follow-up. However, there is no statistically significant difference at the one and three month follow-up visits. And the frequency of pigmented IOL precipitates was however significantly different between the two groups. The authors concluded that prophylactic, pro, uh, prophylactic intracameral TPA is effective in the prevention of a fibrinous effusion at the first two weeks after cataract surgery in the pediatric age group and decreases the incidence of pigmented IOL precipitates. And finally, Leonid et al. evaluated the effect of low-dose three microgram intracameral TPA as an adjunct to lysine extensive recent onset posterior synechiae associated with uveitis in the setting of impending pupillary seclusion in a retrospective case series of three patients, two of which had acute uveitis with rapid and complete synechiolysis, and one had an acute reactivation of their recurrent uveitis with subtotal synechiolysis due to incomplete lysis of chronic synechiae. With resolution of inflammation, all patients regain their pre-uveitis flare visual acuity without any complications from the injections. The authors concluded that intracameral TPA as an adjunct to maximum anti-inflammatory therapy in eyes with extensive recent onset posterior synechiae associated with uveitis leads to rapid lysis of synechiae, reducing the risk of pupillary seclusion and its associated glaucoma. Limitations of our study include it was a retrospective case series with its inherent limitations and lack of control group. We also have yet to gather 12 month follow-up data from the remaining six patients. In conclusion, we report the largest case series of intracameral TPA used at the time of cataract surgery in patients with uveitis. TPA has been shown to be effective for controlling post-operative inflammation in uveitic cataract surgery. However, given the rates of post-operative hyphema further research to assess its safety is needed. Future directions for this project include a multi-center randomized controlled trial to further evaluate the safety and efficacy of TPA in uveitic cataract surgery. Here are my references. And I'd like to thank Drs. La Rochelle and Wen Fan Hu for their ongoing support and allowing me to be a part of this project as well as the research group, uh, including Elizabeth and Deborah for their, their continued support and putting up with me on a near daily basis. I think I have some time for questions. We've got plenty of time. We've got about 10 minutes. Welcome back to Dr. Who.
<laughs> and when welcome back uh tyler great great study i mean a, a lot of great data collection uh, you know i i would assume certainly that these patients had the highest risk of post-operative inflammation uh, and that, that's why they were you know given uh intracameral tpa would it be reasonable uh, or why would it not be reasonable to go back and look at uh, other, you know, uveitic uh, patients who have undergone cataract surgery with uveitis for the same time period to try at least, uh, and at least have some sort of comparison group uh, or is the, are the patient uh, groupings just that different uh, that, that it wouldn't be helpful? Yeah, I think that's a great thought and something that we considered the difficulty is I feel like each uveitis patient is, is in some ways so different. Um, so for example, having a cataract and fibrin and being well controlled um, for their uveitis um, and then having to undergo cataract surgery, um, I just don't know the patient population as far as the numbers that we've that we have. Um, however, maybe Decker's La Rochelle and and you know, and he can talk to that. It looks like Dr. La Rochelle has her hand up. Go ahead. Hi, that was a great presentation, Tyler. Thank you. A lot of data there. Um, yes. You know, speaking to that, Jeff, I was looking at this. We, we did include patients with, with four surgeons and because Dr. Chaya had done some of these cases um, before I started doing most of the combined uveated cataract surgeries. And so at least in my practice, um, the patients I decided to use TPA on was when they, I was doing basically more than just one clock hour of posterior synechiolysis. And you can see in that data that out of all these patients, the synechiolysis was performed in 94% of the cases. So we were really targeting patients with anterior uveitis that had posterior synechiae formation. And I think that's for two reasons. One of them is I think that the actual manipulation of the iris tissue to lice the synechiae is part of what causes the Can you hear us still, Marissa? We, oh, Marissa, we just lost about uh, oh. 15 seconds. Sorry about that. Oh, uh, sorry, carry on. that's the last thing you heard me say. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Rewind about 20 seconds. It was it was just okay. when you were talking about that, you know, um, these patients did require um, synechiolysis. Right. So we, I, at least in my practice, I, I only do TPA when I'm lysing more than like one clock hour of synechiae. And that's for, for two reasons. First, I think that the manipulation of the iris tissue during lysis of the synechiae is part of what causes this exuberant fibrinous reaction and the hyphema. And then also the presence of posterior synechiae itself is probably an indication of those patients with um, anterior uveitis that develop these really robust um, anterior segment inflammation in the first place. And so um, I, I don't typically do this in patients that just have intermediate uveitis or that have had maybe one or two cases of anterior uveitis in the past without any synechiae formation. So um, I do think we're, we're choosing the patients to use TPA and that have indications of a, of a robust anterior segment inflammation in the past. Um, in the beginning, this is anecdotal, but in the beginning, uh, more early on in my career, I wasn't doing it as consistently. And I have, I remember one patient and it was an adolescent. We did combined cataract surgery and vitrectomy. And I, I think truthfully, I probably just forgot to, to use the TPA. It wasn't in the forefront of my mind. And of course she developed this hugely fibrinous reaction despite pre-treating with prednisone and everything. And we did have to go back to the operating room to do an AC washout. And I used TPA at the time of the AC washout. And then the next day she was just perfect. And that case like really cemented it for me that um, anytime we do posterior synechiolysis that, that I do think TPA offers a benefit. So at least in, in my patients, I don't have a control anymore of patients that I've done cataract surgery on and have not used TPA. Um, we'd have to look at sort of the broader Moran surgeons that are still doing uveitic cataract surgery and not using TPA in order to get the data for more of a control set. But that is a great idea. Yeah, I mean, I know Tyler loves uh, mining data, but I would I would anticipate over that same same time frame that just you know 
looking back for uh, Senico lysis cataract patients. Wouldn't surprise me if you could find a similar number um, that, that again could could strengthen that. And of course, you know, we ran into the, the difficulties of how do you do the chart review for these patients? Um, are surgeons listing posterior senecholysis as a, as a procedure code? And I think that's inconsistent. So it can be difficult to identify these patients. I really try to list it as a separate procedure code when I'm, when I'm doing surgery. And so it also helps for data mining in the future. Um, so of course, just one other aspect to consider. And who I feel like we just need to hear from you since you're here. Uh, <laughs> any pearls of wisdom? Oh, I'm here to support Tyler. <laughs> I need all the support I can get. <laughs> and, and Judith Warner did just note, if it is included in the operative report, report it can be found. So that, that is a possibility that even if it wasn't listed as a, uh, an actual procedure code that, um, that could be identified. Judith, you, does Judith. it have to be listed as a... Um, like diagnosis or procedure performed, or if it's just listed in the text of the surgery, can it also be like searched that way? Uh, well, we have to uh, check with the uh, data folks, but um, from what I understand, it can actually be sought, um, especially in um, the epic um, uh, age, it can actually be sought with like a word search. So uh, it's, it's moderately uh, time consuming to set that search up, but our, the data people um, can actually find an actual word in the operative report itself, not just in the diagnosis codes. Obviously diagnosis codes are way easier, but you, know, you, can, you can also make a wide net and search for you know, cataract surgery and somebody with uveitis. And then you know, if it's ever been diagnosed with uveitis, then you can narrow it down from there, but that's, that's the kind of uh, painful process that everybody would prefer to avoid. And then Tyler can just spend the next 10 years of his life reading through all those operative reports. Right. <laughs> Sounds like a great time. Sounds like a job for a medical student. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. No, I, I've used that uh, text finding feature through the EDI um, group and it does work and you can find words, you can specify words on either side of your chosen phrase or word. You can, you can get pretty creative with it. Um, so.